It is June 8, 2020, and 76 years ago, young men fighting in France referred to this as D-Day plus two. The action was still quite hot two days after the Allied invasion of Normandy began, and some troops that were just disembarking then were still coming under fire from German positions. In the British sector, the British 6th Airborne Division was facing a dogged counterattack by the German 346th Infantry Division. And behind Omaha Beach, men of the U.S. 2nd and 5th Rangers and 116th Infantry Regiment were fighting against dogged opposition to rescue the remnants of three companies of Rangers that had been cut off from support. It was a day of action. It was a day of losses. It was a day that would culminate with one of those million acts of bravery that were such a part of the largest amphibious invasion in history and that deserves to be remembered. Of the five beaches assaulted on D-Day, the five-mile stretch in the middle called Omaha, assigned to the U.S. 1st and 29th Infantry Divisions, turned out to be the deadliest. There are many reasons why the sector, sandwiched between the American landing and Utah Beach on the Allied right flank and the British-Canadian sector, Gold, Juno, and Sword Beaches on the left, was deadliest. But a good part of it had to do with the German 352nd Infantry Division. Allied intelligence had determined that the crescent-shaped beach was defended by a reinforced battalion of the 716th Static Infantry Division. The 716th was mobilized for occupation duties. An estimated half the division were non-Germans, men impressed into service from German-occupied countries. Many of the German troops were elderly conscripts. The division had been stripped of its veteran troops, who had been sent to fight the Russians in the east. The men of the 716th had never seen combat. But Allied intelligence was wrong. Omaha Beach was not defended by the 716th Static Infantry Division, but by the 352nd Infantry Division. The 352nd was a new division, formed in November 1943 and originally intended for combat on the Eastern Front. The threat of invasion by the Western Allies has instead sent the division to France to defend the Atlantic Wall. The 352nd was a mix. Nearly half the division were recruits, some just 17 years old. But of the division's 12,000 men, some 6,800 were experienced combat troops drawn from divisions that had been disbanded on the Eastern Front. The 352nd was a substantially more experienced and dangerous unit than the 716th, but somehow Allied intelligence had missed the shift, which had occurred in March. The Allied attack on Omaha Beach was divided between the U.S. 1st and 29th Infantry Divisions. The U.S. 1st Infantry Division was one of the American Army's most veteran. The division had fought across North Africa in an invasion of Sicily before being sent to England to prepare for the invasion of France. But the 29th was untested. Formed in February 1941, the division had shipped to England in October 1942 and had spent the next 20 months training for the invasion. The men of the 29th were itching for a fight, and its 116th Infantry Regiment would be among the first to see that fight, landing on the west side of Omaha Beach, with the men of the 1st Infantry Division's 16th Infantry Regiment landing on the east. Among the men of the 29th was 28-year-old Frank D. Paragoy. Born in Virginia in 1916, Paragoy had joined the Virginia National Guard in 1931. He was only 15, he lied about his age, and in the enlistment his name had been misspelled Paragory with an extra R. He had been awarded the Soldier's Medal, the highest award for bravery a soldier can receive in peacetime for saving a fellow soldier from drowning during a beach patrol in 1941. By D-Day he was a technical sergeant with Company K of the 116th Infantry Regiment. A friend, PFC Felix Branham, said of him, He never tried to raise his voice. If he had a temper, I never knew it. He never tried to be James Cagney like most of us did. The men of the 116th would also be joined by two battalions of Army Rangers. The men of the Rangers were carefully selected and arduously trained. They had training in things like cliff scaling and repelling, as well as extensive assault training preparing to attack heavily defended beaches. The Rangers were given responsibility to attack a promontory called Point de Hawk. The heavily fortified position was the highest point between Utah Beach to the west and Omaha Beach to the east. Three companies of the 2nd Rangers were to land first, landing at the base of the cliff before daylight and using ladders to scale the cliff and take the position. If they were successful in capturing the point, they would be followed by the remaining two companies of the 2nd Rangers and the entirety of the 5th Ranger Battalion. Their goal was to destroy the guns and capture the casemates so that they could not be used by the Germans and then to move inland to the village of Grand Camp. If that first attack failed, the remainders of the 2nd Rangers and the entirety of the 5th Ranger Battalion would instead land on Omaha Beach behind the 116th. They would try to move uphill and tank Point to Hawk via an overland attack. The initial assault didn't go as planned. Companies D, E, and F of the 2nd Rangers boarded their landing craft at 4.45 a.m. 
But in the rough seas, one of the boats carrying 22 men capsized, and all but one of the rangers aboard drowned. In the choppy water, the boats drifted off course, but by the time the error was corrected, the attack was 40 minutes behind, and the remaining rangers, having gotten no signal, had already been sent to land on Omaha Beach. The rangers took Point de Hoc and tracked down and disabled the guns there, which had been moved. But now they were alone, cut off from support, and the Germans began engaging in determined counterattacks. They had trouble getting through by radio, and when they did, they were told that no reinforcements were available. Their relief would have to fight their way up from Omaha Beach. But things were also not going as planned on the beach. Troops began landing on Omaha Beach at 6.30. The troops of the 1st and 29th Divisions were supported by Sherman DD, or duplex drive tanks, specially modified with canvas floating screens to allow them to move through shallow surf. The plan was for the initial landing force to have cleared the beach obstacles in approximately two hours, allowing larger ships to bring in reinforcements, for the troops to move inland, with some hooking up with the rangers at Point de Hoc. But everything was a mess. Rough surf swamped both boats and the wallowing DD tanks. 27 of the initial 29 DD tanks of the 741st Tank Battalion swamped while waiting to shore. The boats that were not swamped were pushed by heavy current and could not find their landing areas because reference points were obscured by smoke. Troops were scattered, missing their landing points and leaving gaps between units. When boats did manage to land troops, many of them had lost their equipment, trying not to drown in the surf, and soldiers were seasick from the choppy ride. Soldiers were often released on sandbars up to 200 yards out and had to move through water up to neck deep at a walking pace, under fire. When they got ashore, they found out that the low clouds had meant that the pre-attack bombardment from the air had been ineffective, leaving the beach defenses undamaged. Captain John Rand of the 5th Rangers described the experience on the beach. And the rifle fire and the machine gun fire was just incessant as it cracked over our heads, as it hit into the breakwaters, as it churned up the turf, as it banged into the road next to us. And it was one horrible noise after another, with a lot of nasty little noises in between. Radios were lost or broken, companies were disorganized, and many leaderless. Some had taken 50% casualties before anyone had made dry land. The engineers set to clear the beach obstacles were likewise scattered, trying to do their work under fire, without infantry or tanks to cover them, and having lost much of their equipment. The second wave of landing craft were hit as hard as the first. The first wave was not able to produce covering fire, and the incoming tide was now covering beach obstacles that were supposed to have been removed, causing havoc to the small landing boats. Vehicles coming ashore made easy targets on the narrow beach. Progress came slowly, and where troops made it off the beach, they were pinned down by machine gun nests inland. The objective of connecting the beachheads was not met. The foothold was tenuous. Fifteen men of Frank Paraguay's K Company were killed in a minefield at the crest of the seawall. The men of Company K spent the night near Verville Road, far from their initial objectives, and more than six miles from the Rangers at Point de Hoc. The landings that day had gone so badly that Lieutenant General Omar Bradley, commander of the U.S. First Army, had considered evacuating Omaha Beach. Lieutenant Horace Henderson of the, of the 6th Engineer Special Brigade landed the morning of June 7th, and he said, The beach was literally covered with the bodies of American soldiers, wearing the blue and gray patches of the 29th Infantry Division. On top of the point, a single platoon of the 5th Rangers had managed to sneak through to reinforce the Rangers. The planned relief would not make it to them that day. The Rangers faced counterattacks all night, and by morning had been driven back to a narrow strip, about 200 yards deep and 500 yards wide. Less than 100 Rangers were fit for combat by morning. They were out of food, low on ammunition. They would likely have been overrun were it not for fire support from ships offshore. And help was still a long time coming. Counterattacks the morning of the 7th compelled commanders of the 29th to keep four of the six ranger companies behind to hold the perimeter. The remainder, including Captain Rand, tried to get to the rangers on the point, accompanied by ten tanks. They made it within a thousand yards of the point, but artillery forced the tanks to retire. The rangers called in their own artillery, but a rumor of a counterattack finally halted the advance. The rangers on the point had to spend another night of counterattacks, wearing down men who had not slept for two days. By morning of June 8th, the Germans were preparing for a final counterattack, assuming the rangers would finally be overrun. But relief was on its way, starting with the bombardment of the German position with 145-inch rounds from the Gleaves-class destroyer USS Ellison. But there was more difficulty. The rangers had been fighting with captured German weapons, and the men of the 116th, hearing the distinctive noise of the German guns, attacked. Four rangers were killed and three injured before a recognition flare stopped the friendly fire. Point de Hoc was secured and the rangers finally relieved. But the Utah and Omaha beachheads were still not connected, and the men of the 116th and the rangers were still fighting to achieve objectives that they were supposed to have met on the first day. They still had work to do on D-Day Plus Two. Supported by tanks of the 743rd Tank Battalion, they had been sent not just to relieve the rangers at the point, 
but to push through and take the German defenses at the village of Grand Camp. The village of Grand Camp was some two miles away and situated on a hill that was covered with defensive fortifications. The approach by the coastal highway led across a small valley with flooded areas on both sides of the road, and the enemy's strong points west of the valley had extensive fields of fire from higher ground. Grand Camp would be the location of some of the most bitter fighting on D-Day Plus 2. Stopped by the fire from the hill, the Americans called in an hour-long barrage from the cruiser HMS Glasgow. The German positions had to be taken in fierce fighting that some of the rangers described as more severe than the fighting on D-Day. But the battalion was stuck by machine gun fire from a particularly strong position. They tried to take it out with tank fire and artillery fire, but nothing worked until Frank Paragoy decided to take action. He worked his way up the hill some 200 yards under fire until he found one of the German trenches. Private Brandon described Frank's action. Paragoy stood up and firing his rifle from his hip, reached the trench and leaped into it, and with a fixed bayonet, he fired, pausing to toss hand grenades. An official account said he encountered a squad of enemy riflemen. He fearlessly attacked them with his hand grenades and bayonet, killed eight, and forced three to surrender. He led the prisoners out of the trench and delivered them to another man from his platoon, and then he jumped back into the trench. Branham said after what appeared to be an eternity, he appeared again. This time, he had 32 Germans. Paraguay had moved down the trench and single-handedly captured the Germans defending it, attacking them with hand grenades until the machine gunners there surrendered. His action cleared the way for the battalion to move forward, although more bitter hand-to-hand -hand fighting was needed to secure the town. Barnum said, after some heavy action and the loss of many friends, it was in our hands by 9 p.m. The German defenses on the hill outside the village of Grand Camp were the German strongest position between the Omaha and Utah beaches, and when they and the artillery batteries in the nearby village of Maisie were taken, German resistance in the area largely collapsed. 76 years ago today, on D-Day, plus two. The men of the 116th were put to work mopping up German stragglers, and on the 11th were placed into the reserve so that they could reorder and reorganize following their losses at D-Day. For his action, Frank Paraguay was awarded the Medal of Honor. The citation read, The extraordinary gallantry and aggressiveness displayed by Tech Sergeant Paraguay are exemplary of the highest tradition of the armed forces. He wouldn't live to receive the medal. The 116th was thrown back into action on June 13th after just two days rest. The following day, June 14th, 1944, Frank Paraguay, while trying to single-handedly take a machine gun in the dangerous Bocage country, was killed in action. His remains are interred at the American Battle Monuments Cemetery in Normandy. Seventy-five years after his death, a road that was named in his honor still bears the misspelling of his surname that came when he enlisted in 1931. After the battle, some came to question whether the attack on Point de Hoc was necessary. The casemates were unfinished. The artillery pieces were in no position to threaten the beaches. But regardless of that controversy, scaling the cliffs at Point de Hoc is considered to have been an act of exceptional bravery. On June 6, 1984, on the 40th anniversary of the day, President Ronald Reagan said of the boys of Point du Hoc, strengthened by their courage, heartened by their valor, and born by their memory, let us continue to stand for the ideals for which they lived and died. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.